So, good morning, Pune. So, and uh, actually, one one uh, great thing about Pune, which has always been said, and I know a lot of uh, uh, Marathi people are here, and they must have uh, read a very renowned writer by the name of uh, Pula Deshpande, right? So, it's it's like uh, it goes like you know there are uh, some major cities in Maharashtra and in, in Pune. Asa mantat ki Pune la abhiman ne jajwalli abhiman asto. आणि अशा टेड कॉन्फरन्सेस सुद्धा पुण्याला म्हणजे पुण्याला अभिमान बाळगायला काही विषय लागत नाही पण टेड कॉन्फरन्स बाजवल बद्दल तर जाज्वल्य अभिमान बाळायला बाळगायला काही हरकत नाही बिकॉज द फर्स्ट टू टॉक्स अँड अँड द प्ले वॉज सो अमेझिंग दॅट आय कॅन ओनली ॲड फ्युएल टू द फायर बिकॉज द फायर इज बिन ऑलरेडी इग्नायटेड सो वेल आय एम गो टू टॉक अबाउट you know those who know anatomy here would know that there are two brains in in our uh, in the skull you know the big brain and the small brain those who have seen a local bollywood movie where you know nana patikar says yaha mat marna ya chhota magaj hota hai but then there is a third brain which we all all possess now but uh, it's the same tragedy about the third brain as it is with the two brains you know like uh, it's said that we only use it hardly a 5% of our uh, brain is used the same thing is with the third brain and the third brain is the digital technology which we have today and regarding brains you know uh, we keep on getting this very funny quotes that you know one quote which uh, was sent to me by one of my friend was that there are two lobes in the brain the left and the right and in the right nothing is left and in the left nothing is right <laughs> which is uh, becoming more and more true about one species of morons in our country called ministers <laughs> you know so uh, well i will begin with uh, i mean how did i get into the digital technology uh, because sometimes history is important most of you know the wrong or the right things we say about things around us the society around us our nation other nations the world you know everything theology ethology everything uh, would actually be uh, decided to a great extent by how much history we know you know and sometimes i think uh, we should give it a break also because uh, such a patriarchal society has been there that we say his story never we say her story so uh, sometimes we should also say her story anyways it's called history so uh, you know what happened is i was a usual kid i was uh, put to a sighted school not to a blind school because uh my parents had a thought that i should go to the same school where my elder sister goes and uh the same reward and punishment should be given uh, to the to the both both the uh kids so i was not put to a blind school and i have used it to uh, to my advantage and sometimes even the undue advantages in my childhood so uh like for example there is one there used to be one very common punishment uh, in the schools like if he do some mischief the boys would be told to sit in the girls and slowly i realized how big an advantage that was <laughs> you know so because my name uh, should be made true so that that's what i did in my school days you know anyways uh, what happened is at the age of 13 or so uh, when i was in my 8th standard uh, my parents decided to send me to us all alone imagine a, a 13 years old kid being sent to us with a visual disability all alone of course uh, my parents had their friends there so i was supposed to stay there but all the travel and everything has to be done alone and uh, the only advantage i had with me rather two advantages i had with me self confidence and english speaking i mean uh, here again i'll make a make a very important note which we all should understand that it's actually great to have uh, you know a respect for our own native tongue and our national language as well you know i have been an anchor i speak hindi urdu i do understand uh, and speak gujarati uh, quite well marathi is my mother tongue uh, but learning english is absolutely essential had i not known english that time i wouldn't have done such a thing or my parents wouldn't have done such a thing so i went there uh, for better educational opportunities which actually fortunately never happened so but in that uh, one and a half months when i was uh, visiting schools i visited one school where i saw a first talking typewriter 
and I was mesmerized, you know, that when you press A, it will say A, when you press B, it will say B, when you press a space bar, when you press a backspace, you want to read an entire line which you have typed. Those days there was not the kind of computers which we use now. It was an electronic typewriter with a talking system built in. So I asked the teacher over there, uh, the lab assistant or whoever you call, that how, how this machine is talking because I knew typing, I had learned typing. If you have seen the typist never look at the keyboard. So what we figured out, the hack basically uh, as we call it, was that if the typist doesn't have to look at the keyboard and still he can type, so I don't look by default. No, that's my advantage. So I had learned typing when I was in seventh. So that was not the thing. What mesmerized me was how it talks back. I mean, it, 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 uh, the biggest disadvantage with the normal typewriter was I could have made a mistake and I would have never known. But now I know. So I asked the teacher, how is it possible? She said, well, it contains a program in it. <laughs> so I was a very small kid. I said, what program? Like I hear in, on radio and TV and that kind of program. She was, well, uh, it's, it's kind of like that and kind of not like that. <laughs> so confusing. You know, so this was kind of a playing spin bowling on a wicket which is turning, you know. And nowadays we have been doing very unfair against South Africa by overturning the pitches. <laughs> I hope when we go to South Africa they will turn us over. <laughs> so I was a bit confused. I asked for details. She gave me a few books in Braille. That is the dot dot, you know, uh, script which blind people used to read, and some cassette tapes. I came back in India because I did not like uh, the lifestyle over there. In my very early days, I have been staying in a chawl all the day, playing around, you know, all, all kind of things, innovative games which we innovated. We created a golf out of marbles, you know, and stuff like that. So I did not like the lifestyle there. I came back and, uh, but I was uh, really, you know, stuck up with that thing. How could it talk? So I started to listen to those tapes. I started to read the books. And then I realized slowly what programming means, what a program means. Program for a layman or a laywoman would be, uh, you have an idea in your brain, you have a concept in your brain, there is some knowledge you have, okay, about solving a problem or for an idea. Now, you have to, with a set of sequential instructions, which are in the form of electrical impulses eventually, you have to put it into an artificial brain which has no five senses like us. We ca it, it, it cannot hear, it cannot speak, it cannot feel on all that. Which means there has to be a brain to brain communication between your brain and the computer processor. And that process of giving the sequential set of instructions in a certain way is called programming. As simple as that. The moment I realized that, the second thought which came to my mind is this doesn't require eyes. I don't think it requires eyes. To think, to, to understand a concept, to gain and give knowledge, it doesn't require eyes. So, uh, unfortunately in 10th standard I came in a merit list. Unfortunately because uh, in those days I have had a few cases I know wherein people have committed suicide because they missed merit list by three, three marks or so and the parents pressurized so much that you should have gone into medical science and then even a medical medico could not save their life. That was the case. So that's why I say medic merit list and all. See, such kind of unhealthy competition which yields nothing is absolutely, you know, objectionable. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, friends, right from our uh, childhood, along with the polio injections and all, we get an injection sometimes of unsecularism, intolerance. And sometimes we also get, or most of the times we get an injection of competition, you know. Right from that junior KG and senior KG, you know, we'll say, baby, run, 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 you have to come first in that race and stuff like that. How many parents encourage kids to come home and say, today I helped an old person pick up the luggage, today I helped a disabled person, today I helped my teacher. <laughs> we don't do that. That, if, if at all it is done, kids, kids would be different citizens when they grow up. They are the beacons of the future of the society, not that I'm very old. So, I have just started to blink, you know. So, uh, well, I had fortune of good gurus, good mentors who actually did that with me. And that's how I am. So when I, when I, when I was in the merit list, they, the journalist and all, they asked me, what do you want to do? I said, I want to become a software engineer. So they thought this, this kid has gone crazy. He's blind. How is he going to ever become a programmer? Okay. 
anyways that time those technologies were not there in india and so i had to take up arts i did my economics but that time i did a smart thing and that was again a hack i said okay i want to become an engineer anyhow tomorrow today tomorrow the technology will come in india i took up two very important subjects in my arts what which was uh, logic and psychology because i believe now when i am pursuing my research that these are the two major subjects which determine how well you can create a software how well you can convey your ideas or represent or implement your ideas on a digital brain that's what you need so uh, then when i graduated then by that time technologies had come in india but they were extremely costly uh, somehow uh, we managed to afford it and i started my software engineering i did it by the time i did my software engineering i was already writing software even before uh, you know the software engineering was over that time i understood the pathetic system of overall it education and it business and i always used to be wondering why so if it is knowledge i mean if you go in a class and if you ask a question to your lecturer and that the bell rings the lecturer will say okay come tomorrow we will, i'll tell you i don't have any time does a lecturer say no i have not been paid to give you this knowledge no one will no teacher will ever say that i have not been paid to give you this knowledge see they are getting paid for their time not for the knowledge because knowledge is not our property knowledge is the gift of god knowledge is the gift of nature if you believe in god if you believe in nature whatever you believe it's that gift because when you say that you know you have earned the knowledge in 3 years what did you do you you used google or some search engine to search knowledge the knowledge on google or anywhere doesn't come from a sky it has been shared by someone you ask your teachers you ask your friends you ask people around you if they had also thought like this why should i share my knowledge where would you get the knowledge so knowledge is never our property which to to actually make knowledge a product is actually a sin it's a social sin if not a legal sin so that's what i realized and 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 then i realized that why there are not a lot of disabled people why there are not of underprivileged people the rural people why all of them are not getting equal opportunities i'm not i'm not just talking about the it industry overall because today you know we talk about age so what kind of an age is this some people say this is like knowledge age some people say this is information age this is technology age well i disagree with all of them because talk about knowledge age right from the day you know when we became uh, homo australopithecus and then we became the homo erectus and then into the homo sapiens and stuff like that the whole transformation has been through knowledge through evolved knowledge we learn to discover fire then the wheel see all these are technologies whatever is created outside the human body or acquired is a technology for that matter human knowledge is a technology because we don't learn to talk as soon as we are born so an axe is a technology a blackboard is a technology and so is a computer so we can't say we are in a technology age we always were in a technology age what we are in today is called the digital age because our language our poetry our science our dancing our music our everything is stored into these zeros and ones what we call as the digital technology and right from our birth till our death the way we take money from the atm the way we communicate nowadays we don't write love letters love emails are written or maybe whatsapp se propose karte i don't know you know we might be doing that so uh, we might be uh, doing all these things through whatsapp through facebook through whatever everything is digitized now right so towards uh, 2006 2007 i met my uh, mentor uh, i was using free and open source technology which you might have uh, heard of all of us nowadays well almost all of us have something called as android which is the best example of success of open source you and me can develop apps and and we can give it for free or non free or whatever we want it's an open platform you know so just to give you an example or we use mozilla firefox which is developed by the community by people like you and me now what happens is that if the ability of digitizing information ability of digitizing life is given into the hands of only few people or few organizations it becomes a very big hazardous danger to the society and that's what has been happening for some time unfortunately all the big proprietary companies have been doing it as a result of which uh, we come down into a british raj or kind of an east india company wherein you know they say we'll give you telegraph we'll give you railway we'll give you post office we'll give you everything but you have to be under our control that's exactly what these proprietary companies do and that's what my mentor 
explain me that if you really want the disabled people if you really want the rural community to be empowered digitally then the digital freedom is the only way so i actually started to work with iit i was an advisor to several governments including the government of malaysia government of brazil i have been doing all these things even the indian state government so there was a project called true vision by elcot the electronics corporation of tamil nadu what we did there i'll just give you an example they wanted to digitally empower the blind people and and uh, they knew me through some acquaintances there was some money available which uh, i may or may not disclose they appointed me as the project leader the first thing i told them is not a single rupee will be used to procure proprietary licenses let's use this same money for you know gathering the teachers from those schools gathering the students giving them the knowledge giving them the workshops because traveling will be involved everything will be involved let's give them you know subsidized computers to those blind schools 